Greetings, brethren. In our era, we've enjoyed keeping the feasts in a peaceful and prosperous way. Now, sometimes we would stay in small cabins in rural settings. At other times, we might camp out, as many have done at Big Sandy in the, the earlier years of the church. Uh, many have stayed in gorgeous condominiums uh, that would we consider very luxur- luxurious uh, by a oceanside setting or in the mountains. But whether well-off or skimping, we have felt the excitement of loving fellowship along with the special sermons and encouragement from a variety of ministers. Even when we are not able to attend services because of health or finances, uh, the brethren encourage us in their own special ways. Uh, I've been able to attend virtually every Feast of Tabernacles uh, since I have been baptized in the Church of God, except one exception. Uh, My wife, Gloria, was pregnant with our son, Daryl, We were in Montana at the time. I was scheduled to go to Squaw Valley, of course, with the family, give my very first sermonette uh, as a a local elder. And at that point, Gloria's labor pain started coming uh, right before we were to leave. And I was not going to deliver our son along the roadside uh, between Montana and Squaw Valley, California. So that was the one and only time that we've missed the Feast of Tabernacles, and we were so encouraged by brethren stopping by our home uh, while they were leaving, although it was rather sad to see the uh, taillights of the cars leaving in the distance as they were heading for the feast. But we were, again, very, uh, very encouraged uh, by their well wishes and their remembering us while they were at the feast. Uh, Today, we're even able to hear the festival sermons Uh, thanks to technology that God has given us to use. In more recent years, there have been more difficult circumstances, especially in the non-Western countries. But overall, we have observed the feast in the good times. But not every era has experienced peace and safety. Uh, When Israel kept the Passover in the time of Moses, they were slaves in Egypt. The very day before a Passover, Haman's request to exterminate all the Jews was signed and signified by the king of Persia. Jesus Christ was crucified on the Passover, and his disciples scattered. It was while crowds were in Jerusalem for the Passover that the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem, the temple, trapping the people inside, preparing for its complete destruction. In 70 A.D., the final fall of the Jewish resistance of Masada occurred during the days of unleavened bread. On the Passover in 1943, 35,000 Jews in in the Warsaw Ghetto staged an uprising against the Nazis. And these 35,000 were the ones left from originally 450,000 living there. In 1973, combined Egyptian and Syrian forces, with the help of nine other Arab and non-Arab countries, attacked Israel on the Day of Atonement. Well, how would we observe the feasts in in such diverse conditions and difficult times? The title of today's sermon is Keeping the Feasts in Good Times and in Bad Times. I'm going to cover some of the feast experiences of God's people throughout history to show the kind of attitude that we should have today. You know, there are times, as I mentioned in the introduction, that we've kept the feast in times of peace and safety. And there were especially inspiring times when knowledge had been lost and then regained and individuals were so excited about the truth of God. One such occasion was in 2 Chronicles chapter 30. In verse 1, it says, Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Eternal at Jerusalem to keep the feast of Passover uh, to the Lord God of Israel. For the king and his leaders and all the congregation in Jerusalem had agreed to keep the Passover in the second month 
for they could not keep it at the uh, original time, at that time, because the priests had not sanctified themselves, nor had the people gathered together at Jerusalem. And so it was an exciting time to, in a sense, revive the knowledge and dedication to the eternal God. In verse 21, And the children of Israel who were present at Jerusalem kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with great gladness. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing to the Lord accompanied by loud instruments. And Hezekiah gave encouragement to all the Levites who taught the good knowledge of God. And they ate throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to the Lord their God. So it was a special occasion, a memorable occasion for God's people at that time. Another occasion we find in the book of Nehemiah. And not all these feasts took place, obviously, at the Feast of Tabernacles, but it does give you a feeling uh, for the the joy, the blessings of being able to keep the Feast of Tabernacles or other feasts uh, at special times in history. The book of Nehemiah, uh, we find in chapter 8 and verse 1. Nehemiah chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. So it was crowded. People were kind of crushed together. And they were there for a great purpose. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. And so Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation of men and women And all who could understand, who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. So this was a fall feast that we're referring to. And then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday. So we're talking morning services as we often have, uh, both morning and afternoon services during the feasts. So this was a morning service. And the law was read before the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. You know, they wanted to hear the good word of God. Uh, They were now willing to be encouraged and strengthened by the words of God. In verse 5, says, after mentioning that Ezra stood on a platform of wood, as many ministers will be standing on a a platform of wood. It says in verse 5, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. So sometimes it is important to realize that we are reading uh, from God's word. These are not our own words, our own uh, notes. For Ezra was standing above all the people when he opened it, and all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the eternal, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen. That is, let it be so. Amen. While lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And then others who assisted Ezra uh, helped the people understand the law, and the people stood in their place. Verse 8, so they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense they gave the meaning. They expounded it, as, as you would hear Dr. Meredith and other of the evangelists and ministers during the feast. They, they not only read the Scripture, but try to explain the deep meaning behind it. And they helped them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites... Uh, who taught the people, said to all the people, this day is holy to the eternal your God. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Now, they were emotionally moved by it. But Ezra mentioned in Nehemiah, you know, this is not the time to weep. You know, this is a time of great joy and and, uh, wonderful experiences. He said to them, go your way. Uh, eat the fat. He didn't mean literally the, the a fatty meat, but he meant, you know, that which is uh, really uh, excellent food. 
the rich, desirable food. Drink the sweet. Send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Don't sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Oftentimes that's what really does keep us, uh, at least partially, in the work of God in the church of God. Uh, We understand Christ living in us. We understand all the other aspects. But one reason why we're here is because we understand what is happening. We understand our future. And we are joyful. We are glad what God has to offer us. And it's not hopelessness that keeps us in the church. It's not fear. It's not danger. But oftentimes it is the joy of the eternal. God's spirit, you know, his love, his joy, his peace in our mind. It's our strength. And the Levites quieted all the people saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Don't be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat, to drink, to send portions, and rejoiced greatly because they understood the words that were declared to them. And so in times such as these, it was a wonderful experience. And the brethren, uh, men and women, and oftentimes obviously the children, their families, uh, were there to learn the way of God. And it was an exhilarating experience. Now, now there is a, a caution here that we have to remember that God and His ways are, are, are blessings to us. And uh, we're not to go hog wild in our prosperity. Uh, we do understand that. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, uh, many have talked about when they first went to the Feast of Tabernacles, if they had any uh, good funds at all, would oftentimes uh, maybe eat a little more, drink a little more than they were used to, and uh, went further than what perhaps God would want them to. But Isaiah 5, verse 11, he says, You know, woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink. You know, we may rise up in the morning during the feast to, to pray, to get in a little extra study, to spend some time with the family, to have a nice breakfast, to prepare for the day, uh, but not to uh, follow intoxicating drink. Uh, he talks about those who continue until night, till wine inflames them. The harp and the strings and tambourine and the flute and wine are in their feast, but they do not regard the work of the Lord. And that's the key. You know, we are to enjoy, you know, whatever drink that we might uh, find pleasure in, in moderation. We might enjoy a variety of foods and experiences But always in regard to the work of the Lord. Always in regard to why are we there at the Feast of Tabernacles. Or if we're not able to to be there because of health or other circumstances. uh, We still understand that as we keep it at home, we have a purpose. There is a work of God. And bringing many sons to glory. Preparing for the coming of Jesus Christ and these millennial blessings. So even in times of peace and safety... We still regard God's purposes, God's work. Now, there are also times that we may experience poverty or financial distress. Uh, There are times when individuals just learn about the Feast of Tabernacles. I remember one uh, couple, uh, when I was first starting out as a ministerial trainee, that they had learned about the feast. Uh, They had not prepared for it, and so they kept the feast in a city park in a tent, and that was their Feast of Tabernacles. Unfortunately, they uh, didn't realize the time of the calendar, and so they kept it a month early. And uh, later on, they were able to actually go to the feast where God's ministers and God's people were assembling. But we've just suffered a financial crisis in the United States that some believe has not been seen in over a 100 years. Uh, Brethren, uh, for the most part, are working, but there are some who have been underemployed, or is struggling financially during this time period. Uh, we also might consider what would have happened if the uh, banking system had totally collapsed. What would have happened if the nation had entered a period of financial chaos? How would we have kept the feast of God? Well, let's turn to First Timothy chapter six. Because we know by faith we would keep the feast one way or another. 
But in a time of financial stress or poverty or difficulty, uh, we would still keep it, but with this spirit and attitude. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Uh, we would understand that the spiritual takes precedent. Oftentimes we really do enjoy the physical things of the feast. But as Paul writes to Timothy, it's godliness, a godly mind and approach with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world. And there has been no exception to that. Now, maybe our families were either well off or had uh, certain benefits or uh, blessings. But individually, when we come out of the womb, uh, we have nothing. Yeah, we don't have little tuxedos or uh, beautiful prom dresses or other uh, special uh, physical accoutrements. Uh, we all come out the same way, naked and usually crying. And so it is certain, uh, even when we die, we can carry nothing out. That's reality. The Egyptians thought that they could, uh, but even they couldn't. You know, their tombs were robbed. And, uh, you know, they didn't carry out really servants and property and possessions. Uh, that was all an illusion. And so when we are born, when we die, we essentially are what we are. So Paul writes, having food and clothing... With these we shall be content. And uh, many brethren I've known through the years who've kept the Feast of Tabernacles, especially when they first start out and when they have not had a chance to uh, save up a festival tithe, uh, they have very basic clothing and food for the feast, but they are really wonderfully attuned to the spiritual teachings and blessings of the Church of God. And they're content. They're content just to be at the feast but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and to many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And so sometimes if we're not careful, we don't have godly character or if we're not thinking in terms of godliness or regarding the work of God, and then we have lots of money and resources. We may not use it properly even to keep the feast the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And God never intended the Feast of Tabernacles to be a feast of greediness or evil or sorrows. But we are to keep the feast in a godly way with the financial blessings that God has provided. But you, O man of God, Flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. You fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So we find that, again, if you are wealthy, you use it rightly, but if you are not wealthy or not, don't have a lot of excess money to keep the feast, you still do it in a godly way. Uh, you may barely get to the feast or you may have to stay at home, but you're still doing it in a godly way. And you're fighting the good fight of faith. And the sermons you'll be hearing encourage you, encourages you that we have a tremendous future as God's people, uh, as the saints ruling with Christ. And also the blessings God will pour upon all nations uh, that survive and live during that millennial uh, era. And so Paul says, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things. And before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. 
And then uh, Paul to Timothy ends with these concepts. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. And let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. And so we encourage individuals who keep the feast, whether at the feast itself or sometimes at home uh, because of circumstances, but to truly examine uh, themselves, examine ourselves to our attitudes of giving and receiving, of remembering if we do have the blessing of being at the feast, remembering those who may be at home and sharing as is appropriate that would encourage and strengthen uh, those brethren. Uh, Or if we're on the uh, receiving side, that we're thankful. We realize that we may not have much, but God is the almighty blesser and giver of all things. And whatever we receive, we truly appreciate. And we pray, even if we're at home, we pray for those who are at the feast site, for their safety and their protection and their inspiration. And so, again, whether we're poor, whether we're rich, we're praying for each other. We're, We're sharing together. Uh, We're having a right spirit toward each other because we're all uh, men and women, you know, fellow children of God. And the result is, verse 19, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So in times of uh, personal poverty or at least less finances than what we would hope for, Uh, we can still keep the feast in a very giving and loving and sharing way. Matthew chapter 6 is a scripture that we often refer to. Very important because we're talking about a mindset, how we look at life, how we look at the blessings God has given us. Matthew 6, verse 31, he says, Therefore, don't worry. Don't get really anxiously upset saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, you know, those who aren't called and worked with by God at this point. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. So God is well aware of what our needs are. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. And so therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Again, trust God. Seek God's kingdom. Seek what this feast pictures. Seek God's righteousness. And whatever circumstance you're in, God will provide. And you will have a blessed feast. Is that in our day, we've been able to provide some who cannot afford to attend with special uh, feast sermons, they can play at home. Uh, Brethren often remember those with cards, those individuals at home with cards, phone calls, or in uh, other special ways to provide encouragement. And there are times when we've been able, as a church, to help provide the means to go to a feast. Uh, Maybe not with all the luxuries, but the basics, so they can uh, be there in fellowship with the brethren. Now, there may be times of personal and national crisis which may not always be financial in that sense. Let's go to the book of Lamentations, chapter 1. The book of Lamentations, which is sandwiched between Jeremiah and Ezekiel, we find that there's a circumstance mentioned here in chapter 1, verse 3. And there have been such times as these. Uh, Verse 3, Judah has gone into captivity under affliction and hard servitude. She dwells among the nations. She's now captive. She finds no rest. All her persecutors overtake her in dire straits. The roads to to Zion uh, mourn because no one comes to the set feasts. You know, they're in captivity. They, they have no longer access to the temple 
the way they were described here in the book of Lamentations. They can't get to the feast as a people. All her gates are desolate. Her priests sigh. Her virgins are afflicted. And she is in bitterness. What, what about such a national crisis? And when you l- read the history, you find that uh, in the glory days of the temple, there'd be uh, pilgrims approaching Jerusalem. And if the light was just, just right, you know, all the, uh, the uh, metals and the uh, decorations were shined and cleaned. And there was this, this tremendous gleam that came out of the temple. And the pilgrims would, would fellowship together and they would sing. And as they got close, to be more and more together as they, they tro- uh, trod the roads to Jerusalem. And it was a, a joyous thing. And they, they enjoyed the set feast, the appointed times. But here's a time when the temple is not available. The gates are desolate. Uh, those who be participating, the Levites, uh, can no longer function. Even the virgins are afflicted and, and she's in bitterness. Her adversaries have become the master. Her enemies are the ones who prosper. For the Lord has afflicted her because of the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone into captivity before the enemy. And from the daughter of Zion, all her splendor has departed. So we begin to get a little bit of picture of what was happening and can happen during the time of national captivity. And said there have been circumstances that for limited areas, uh, there have been like World War II, uh, where Jews who were used to at least going to their synagogues for the Sabbath and for the holy days no longer had access to them. And they maybe have been in concentration camps or scattered. And it was very difficult for them. Again, the splendor had departed. And yet they still kept the feast. There are records of that. I have several books on my shelf at at home that describe, again, Jews still trying to keep the feast under these kind of circumstances. Uh, We know in in Psalm 42, the individual whom God inspired to write this particular psalm has this to say, Psalm 42, verse 1. By the way, from the Expositor's Bible Commentary, the uh, commentary says this, it is evident that the psalmist was isolated from temple worship. He may have been a refugee, but it's more likely that he had been exiled. And when you read Psalm 42, verse 1, it says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And he cries out, when shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food night and day while they continually say to me, where is your God? So it's a time period where this, this individual was cut off. And, you know, he's desiring, when can I come before the living God? When can I go back to worship God? Uh, he was, again, exiled or cut off in some form or fashion. And it was devastated, devastating to that individual. And there was a little bit of depression. He said in verse 11, Why are you cast down my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. So again, there was that that hope that things would change around. He would again uh, have that right worship before God. And certainly the festival periods were, were prime times of that worship toward God. And Psalm 43 continues, as the commentary says, that it, both psalms seem to continue the uh, same thought. And he talks about, uh, you know, sending out, verse 3, your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill, to your tabernacle. And then I will go to the altar of God, to, my, to God, my exceeding joy. And on, my, on the harp I will praise you, O God, my God. He says in verse 5, the last part, you know, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. So there have been times when perhaps people have been cut off from the uh, ability to, to worship God, whether it be on the Sabbath or the feast days or in just normal circumstances. Uh, 
And yet their, their thirst is remembering and since the old times, the, the glory days. And they thirst for God and they, they pray for the time when they can again keep the feast days like they used to in times of prosperity and goodness. But their hope remains steadfast in God. And we find that they, you know, they, they do keep the feast in their own ways the best they can until God restores them to that worship. And all things do work for good, even under those times of personal national crises. As Paul mentions Romans 8, again, all things work together for good. Even in those kind of crises, we learn things. In this case, they were learning to, again, thirst again for God, to cry out for God, to have that right relationship with Him. Now, in a similar way, there may be times where it's not a national crisis per se, but it may be a time of grievous personal problems. And by the way, those kind of circumstances could happen uh, in, in good times as well as bad times. It doesn't really depend on our financial circumstances uh, or even the locations God provides us to observe the feast. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. The book of 1 Samuel chapter 1. This is such a, again, a moving and poignant uh, story that is a part of the history of God. In 1 Samuel 1, now there was a, verse 1, there was a certain man uh, of Ramathaim, uh, Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim. His name was Elkanah. And of course, he was an Ephraimite. It talks about his background. Verse 2, we had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. The name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, we're not advocating an individual having two wives here. Just as this was the circumstance at this time. Uh, one had children, which God considered a tremendous blessing for a family. Hannah didn't have children, couldn't have children. This man went up from his city year, yearly to worship and sacrifice to the eternal of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina his wife and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah although the Lord had closed her womb. But, and this should never have happened, but it did, her rival, you know, the other wife of Elkanah, provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So who knows what kind of horrible words were said that will like, look how God has blessed me. I've got children. Obviously, you're under a curse. You don't have children. Or maybe, you know, God show, has shown me that I love, you know, my husband more than you love him. You know, who knows? But the words were hurtful. And they provoked her severely. They made her miserable. So as year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, and this was again yearly, so it would be at a feast time, that she provoked her and therefore she wept and did not eat. So a time of a horrible, grievous personal problem here. And when you think of the feast as this is a wonderful time, you know, we, we joy in going to the feast. It was almost like a, an extra burden to, to her. And then Elkanah said, her husband said to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? And by the way, Elkanah really meant well. And I know he truly meant this, that, that Elkanah treated Hannah in a very special way, trying to make up for Hannah not being able to have children. But as probably most women would understand, that Elkanah just didn't get it. You know, Elkanah, as, as much as he loved his wife, didn't fully understand the emotions and the, the, the depth of grief that she felt under these circumstances. But he did try his best to comfort and to love his wife, and that was appropriate. 
but he still couldn't make up for the deficiency. Now, Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now, Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the eternal and wept in anguish. And then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant, remember me, don't forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. Well, this is, again, not always a wise thing to do. We don't recommend making vows to get a particular blessing the way she did. But her heart was right. You know, she loved God. She was afflicted. And she was willing to make any sacrifice that God would bless her and, and, and hear her prayer. Well, as it happened, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli watched her mouth. Now, we have to be careful of jumping to conclusions. So Eli was watching. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, but her lips moved. Her voice was not heard. And therefore Eli thought she was drunk. Now instead of asking her, he immediately condemned her. He said, how long will you be drunk? He didn't ask if you were drunk or were you praying or is there some other problem that I can help you with? He simply said, listen, how long have you been drunk? Put your wine away from you. Well, Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink. I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Don't consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. Well, Eli had the at least the presence of mind and a right spirit to admit that he was wrong. And he said, then go in peace. And the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way, ate, and her face was no longer sad. Uh, we know the rest of the story, how God blessed uh, Hannah. And she ended up with a son who, of course, this particular book was named after, Samuel, and turned out to be a very powerful servant of God. But the reason I'm expressing this particular example is that sometimes we go to the feast with emotional and mental burdens. There are women who desperately would like a child, male or female, but just to have a child. You know, they're married. Maybe they've been married a long time, but for whatever reason can't have children. And so they go to the feast and they see all the other children, and, you know, women with, with uh, their children and families together. And to, to them, it's not maybe as joyful because they, they kind of wish, you know, I wish that could be me. I wish God would heal me or make it possible to have a child. There There might be other particular burdens. Maybe they are... They have a health problem, and they hurt, and they're in pain, and they're suffering. And they're saying, well, well, God, maybe this feast will be the time. And God will pour out perhaps more of the gifts of his Holy Spirit. And perhaps this is the feast. I'll be healed and relieved of the pain and suffering. Or maybe this is the feast that the blind can see. Maybe this is the feast that the deaf can hear. Maybe this is the feast that I can get out of this wheelchair and begin to walk. Maybe this is the feast. God will heal me of my diabetes or other affliction, and I can then eat uh, normally, hopefully the right way now, but at least I can eat normally, and I can live life in a more normal way. Maybe this is the year that God will heal my heart or uh, my circulatory system or my asthma or my breathing or whatever it is. And so at a feast, you may be going to that feast or staying at home with those conditions and uh, you're not as joyful, not as sad. But if you are facing such trial, then this is the example. Perhaps some extra prayer and study would be important to your keeping the feast. 
you're not necessarily vowing a vow like Hannah did, but really crying out to God, saying, you know, this is your annual feast. You know, this is the feast that pictures the, the world ahead, the time of, of you healing the world, you know, healing the waters so that they're clean again, pure again, where people, you know, are healed of their afflictions, where nations are brought back to their, their homeland, where blessings are poured out. And, you know, please, God, help me to have, you know, at least a portion of those blessings now as a uh, man or woman of God. Uh, or maybe a child is, you know, actually having the same kind of difficulties. So, again, a little extra fervency in prayer and study and crying out. You know, who knows that God may hear and turn and leave a blessing. And you know, when Christ faced the greatest physical trial of his life, he kept his thoughts positive, and he sought God in fervent prayer. That was his example. In the book of Luke, chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, beginning here in verse 14. When, he, when the hour had come, referring to the Passover, remember this is the last Passover that he was on this earth in the flesh. This is before his coming trial and crucifixion. He sat down and the 12 apostles with him. He said to them with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So Jesus Christ understood he needed the encouragement of the Passover. He needed fellowship with the disciples. And he understood it was going to be a great time of suffering. In verse 28 he said, now you, uh, you are those who have continued with me in my trials. So it's very good that we have individuals, if, if you know of someone who has a trial, uh, be a friend to them, be of encouragement to them, strengthen them, you know, help them to have faith that eventually God is going to intervene and that trial will end. And he says to the disciples, you are those who have continued with me in my trials and I bestow upon you a kingdom just as my Father bestowed upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging 12 tribes of Israel. And notice, what was Christ's mind on? He was aware it's going to be a horrible time of excruciating agony and suffering. But he kept his mind on what it would accomplish, the kingdom of God, the saints ruling with Jesus Christ. And uh, he, he thought that way. He kept his thoughts on the kingdom, the purpose of life. In Matthew uh, 26, Matthew 26, verse 36, Christ prayed in a very special and fervent way, just you know, like Hannah prayed, but even more than Hannah. Uh, Matthew 26, verse 36 then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. He began to be uh, sorrowfully and deeply distressed. When he said to them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. In other words, your will be done. And he prayed this way, not just once, but several times. And again, just like great, uh, you know, sweat like great drops of blood. And he was fervent. And he understood he wanted deliverance, but he also wanted, more importantly, God's will to be done. And God strengthened him and helped him to get through this trial, which, again, has been such a blessing for all humanity that the, uh, you know, the, the Feast of Tabernacles could not even have been really envisioned without this first step. 
that we're, we're hearing about here. And again, Christ's fervent prayer in times of a great personal trial uh, was answered by God. In Matthew 11 and verse 28, Matthew 11, verse 28. Christ said, Come to me, all you who, are, who, who labor, are heavy laden, you know, loaded down in some way or another, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy my burden is light. There are times we have to let God take charge of things beyond our control. Uh, God knows our sufferings, our particular circumstances. But he says, with all of that, you who are heavy laden, you're loaded down with cares or problems, and you seek your God. Come to Jesus Christ in fervent prayer. Let God Ease that load. And Jesus Christ promises he will. There have also been times where we've kept the feast in a time of spiritual confusion. There have been times when the very keeping of the feast days have been challenged. Some individuals will say you're keeping it on the wrong day. Yes, the living church of God keeps it on this day. Well, we're keeping this feast a month either later or a month earlier. We've got a more accurate calendar. Or you're keeping the church or the uh, feast days in one way. You're, you're too strict. You're too, uh, too liberal. And so uh, follow our teachings and tell there's confusion on how to observe the feast, manner of keeping the feast, even when to keep the feast. Well, let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And that certainly has been a uh, ongoing problem uh, in regard to the church as far as just being bombarded with such contrary ideas uh, in our day and age because of maybe partly because of the internet, which is it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful invention of humankind can disseminate information uh, so quickly and effectively, but can also disseminate uh, wrong things quickly and effectively. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. Paul writes to Timothy, the young evangelist, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God the pillar, the, the, uh, the very ground or bulwark of the truth. And so he's saying to, to Timothy that if you want to know how to conduct yourself, you know, how to keep the feast, how to, how to really live God's way of life, then you, you go to the church of God. You know, here, he's an apostle You're representing the, the very foundation of God's teachings and, and church. He says, you rely on that. Another scripture that uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, you know, remember or know from whom you have learned. Now, you rely on those individuals you know through the years have set a right pattern of conduct, a right pattern of teaching, who have been uh, sound-minded in support of the preaching of the gospel throughout the world as a witness, who have been stable, who have really poured their hearts out to God in service, to remember from whom you have learned these things and follow after. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Again, what do you do when you're faced with confusing ideas in regard to the feast? I mean, even to the point of when do you go? Where do you go? With whom do you fellowship? What does the feast mean? How do you observe it? Colossians 2, verse 6. Paul writes this particular letter. He says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, 
so walk in him. And how we receive God. You have to think about that. How did you first come into the church of God? How did you first learn about not only the weekly festival, the Sabbath, but the annual festivals? From where did you learn these things? Well, we've learned them from the ministers who have preached what Christ has preached or written or had inspired written in the Bible. Uh, he, we, Paul writes, rooted, built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. So when we think, and many of us have been in the church, you know, decades. And we can go right back to the very beginning of our calling that we were taught by going through the scriptures in the Holy Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, that's where we learned about the, the Sabbath, and eventually the Holy Days, and what they meant. We were taught by faithful ministers through the years, year in and year out. And so we were established in the faith as we had been taught and very thankful for what God has provided for us. So he says, beware. This is a warning. Beware lest anyone cheat you. It will rob you of your reward, perhaps even your salvation through philosophy and empty deceit. You know, where, where do the ideas that we receive come from? In the living church of God, they come from the Holy Bible. You know, th this is where everything comes from. That's our foundation. It's the, in a sense, the, the Word of God in print. Uh, we don't come with philosophy, clever human ideas, empty deceit. Uh, we don't go to the tradition of men, you know, uh, things that men think are, are good to uh, keep this thing or that tradition or that way of life. Uh, we, uh, and it says, according to the basic principles of the world, but not according to Christ. We don't, you know, choose between the Bible and somebody else. We always choose the words of Christ, what's in the scriptures. For in him... That is, Jesus Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So that's where we get our sort of information. And we go back to the scriptures. We rely on what Paul mentioned about the ministry, how God gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, so that we'd all come to the maturity, perfection of Jesus Christ, the unity of the knowledge of the Son of Man. Uh, we, we rely on that. And we again go to the Scriptures. We look up those Scriptures, those passages. And we see the days that were kept both in the Old and New Testaments. And we also understand how the church was inspired by God to keep these feasts in a very special way. And we continue in those teachings and understandings. He talks about how, again, our sins have been forgiven, our debts in the sense of uh, wages of sin is death, and how that was forgiven uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ through the crucifixion. And then finally, verse 16, he says, therefore, let no one judge you. Don't let anyone condemn you, criticize you, uh, make fun of you, challenge you. In food or in drink or in regard to a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. You know, people are going to challenge you in maybe what you eat. Saying, well, you can eat all things. You can eat, you know, the shrimp and the pork or whatever. Or they may say that, well, no, you can't eat that. You know, you've got to eat the way God explained. But you're not eating enough. You ought to really party hardy. And gorge yourself is, is a feast. Or they'll say, no, you really should eat very, very little. And maybe mostly fast. Uh, yes, you can drink, but nothing alcohol. Uh, or, yes, you can drink alcohol, but, you know, you know go ahead and drink to your heart's content till you get uh, drunk. And some might say that uh, you should be able to keep the feast or maybe not keep the feast in a special way. You should meet together together. 
not to meet together, all sorts of confusing ideas. He said, don't let anyone confuse you in regard to these things, which are a shadow of things to come. You know, God's Sabbath, God's holy days, picture things which are to come. They're in one sense prophetic and encouraging, showing our purpose in life. But that next sentence, but the substance that is the the body of Christ. And what Paul is saying is that let no one judge you or condemn you, but it's the body of Christ. That organization is what to guide you and teach you and how to apply the laws of God you've seen with your own eyes in the Bible. What is the body of Christ? Colossians 1 verse 18. He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So he's saying, let the church of God, again, that church that you have proved, it's been time, uh, time tested. It has been solid and balanced and wise in understanding how you apply the laws of God. So let that be your guide. So in a time of spiritual confusion, again, rely on the church that, again, you have trusted and learned to rely on. Let no one defraud you of your reward. Taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Says that, that, that you know, such people, uh, such philosophies do exist. And, you know, some will say, you know, don't spend your festival tithe on yourself. Give it to somebody. You don't even have to keep the feast. Take that money and give to the poor. And that way, that way you'll, you'll be uh, more religious. You'll be more spiritual. Whereas, again, that wasn't God's intention. God was saying, no, I want you to experience a little bit of prosperity. I want to give you a foretaste of the coming kingdom of God. And what these people who are giving false advice, either, again, eat, drink, and be merry, you know, go uh, party hardy, uh, po- uh, party whole hog, uh, or uh, be very, very uh, frugal, circumspe- uh, circumspect. Uh, what's happened is, verse 19, they aren't holding fast to the head. When they go to those extremes, they aren't holding fast to Jesus Christ, from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase which is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, and we did, and we gave our lives to God, and we said, not our will be done, your will be done. You know, not our philosophy of life, but what we see in the Holy Scriptures, we live by every word of God. And we also understand you know, how that word is, is really understood as God inspires the church. And so, therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles, rudimentary principles of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle? And we're not talking about God's laws and prohibitions and directions. These are human ideas. You know, uh, sex is bad or uh, don't taste. You know, uh, you try to deprive yourself that not all good things are good to actually eat. You know, don't handle it. We're not talking again about God's way of life, but human regulations, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. All sorts of, again, weird ideas how the feast should be kept and what you should do on the feast and how you should eat and drink and act. And God is saying, don't follow the doctrines of men. You follow the word of God. And what is God has revealed to the church? These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. So if you were thin raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. And that's what Paul is trying to write again to the brethren in the Colossian uh, congregation. So in times of spiritual confusion, again, we really do want to uh, trust our God and the uh, church that he has provided. You know, each year that we live, 
And each year that we observe the Feast of God, we're going to be encountering different situations. Even in Ecclesiastes, he said there were different seasons and purposes in life, a time to be born, a time to die, a time for this, a time for that, a time to you know, sow, a time to reap. You know, in the church of God, there will be times of prosperity, safety, and ease. There will also be times of financial stress. There will be times of severe personal trials. There will be times of national calamities. There will be times of spiritual battles. In the good times and the bad times, God wants us to to keep our focus. We go back to Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12. God wants us to keep the feast, which said uh, really inspire us to uh, understand our full purpose of life. God wants us again in all the different seasons that we find ourselves to focus again on God. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. In a sense, this is, is what life is all about. That we're to become like God and follow his principles of love uh, toward God with all of our heart and being and love toward our neighbors as ourselves and to keep all of his commandments that show the way to life. And we should be doing this regardless of circumstances. Uh, one last scripture, Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Whether you're hearing this at home or you're you know, hoping that Maybe uh, next year you'll have enough tithe to uh, keep the feast with all the rest of the brethren. Uh, Or if you have a particular health problem or trial or test, again, focus in on this. You're still keeping the feast. Maybe not in fully the way you want to, but you're obeying God. You're learning to fear God. You've got your mind on eternity here. Uh, Psalm 19, verse 7. The psalmist writes, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting or changing your life. Remember, part of the the law of God, part of the statutes had to do with the holy days, including this Feast of Tabernacles. He's saying, by keeping God's law, it's going to change us. It's going to change our focus, our way of thinking, our behavior. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple the statutes of the lord are right rejoicing the heart and that's why even if you cannot meet with the full body of christ at a particular festival location when you hear hear the sermon when you hear the scripture it's rejoicing to you it's it's a joy It, it makes you realize you're on the right track the commandment of the lord is pure enlightening the eyes It gives us more understanding and purpose and hope for the future. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. So, brethren, wherever we are keeping the Feast of Tabernacles this year, in whatever personal circumstance, uh, whether, again, with the full body of Christ or, you know, you're at home, kind of isolated, hopefully with the encouragement, though, of brethren uh, who are sending you letters or perhaps uh, at least encouraging you in one way or another. But whatever your circumstance is, if you approach the Feast with the mind of God, you are going to be rewarded in every sense of the word. You're going to be enlightened. Uh, it's going to rejoice your heart. You are going to be blessed by what you are doing. And this blessing will come whether in good times or in bad times, whether in times of great stress or great peace and prosperity. Brethren, you obey God. 
you cry out to God, you put your lives in God's hand, obey his laws, keep the feast in the best way you're able to keep, and God is going to reward you with tremendous blessings and especially spiritual blessings now and for eternity in the kingdom of God.